Uh, they will. We're, we're going to, uh, the way we'll proceed is I'll start. Uh, then we're going to hear from uh, the Secretary of the Agency of Commerce, Lindsay Curley, who's here, and uh, Commissioner, Mr. Harrington. And uh, we're going to hear from Sasha Mayer of Mamaba, incredible small business that's becoming a big business. And then uh, Sue Minter, who's the director of Capstone. Um, and I'll make some, some opening remarks. Uh, only a few weeks ago, none of us ever could have imagined that we'd now be living in a state where uh, we have the order by the governor to close our schools, uh, where uh, businesses are trying to adopt procedures to telecommute, uh, and where uh, the economy is obviously threatened. Uh, but public health is really threatened with this virus uh, that is spreading into Vermont. We now have uh, 12 confirmed cases here in the state of Vermont. And this virus is a problem and a challenge that we've really never faced. Uh, it's not as though you can put up a wall. It's not as though you can deny its reality. Uh, it has a will of its own uh, in how it spreads. Uh, what we can do is take real precautions, but it's going to take action at the federal level, it's going to take action at the state level, and it's going to take personal behavior. And all three have to work together. Uh, we've been taking action in Washington. Uh, and let me just say with some modesty here, of the folks who have to respond, individuals, the state government, in the federal government, in many ways, the job we have at the federal level is the easiest. It's incredibly important, but the challenges of actual execution fall on the responsibility of the state, uh, and a lot of our employers, a lot of our community action agencies. Uh, at the federal level, I think there's two primary roles that we have to play. One is to give accurate and transparent uh, information about the virus and what are the best steps, and what are the best procedures to follow uh, in order to uh, mitigate. And uh, the uh, Center for Disease, Disease Control and Dr. Fauci, uh, I think, are excellent. And Dr. Fauci, in particular, has had experience with infectious diseases. Uh, he's trusted. He served in six administrations, Republican and Democrat is highly respected, and getting that information out through him and others in the public health sector I think is very helpful to our states and to uh, our local health care providers. The second area of responsibility at the federal level is to get resources back to the state, to our businesses, and to our people. And in contrast to what is going on much of the time in Washington, there is a bipartisan approach to this. It's all hands on deck in Washington. Uh, we know that whoever we represent, it matters not whether, uh, what their political affiliation is, uh, this disease, this virus is going to show no favors. We've done two things so far. The first was the $8.3 billion appropriation, uh, and that, has an, that goes back to the states, by and large, except some money to aggressively pursue a vaccine. Uh, Medicaid money back to the states to assist in the delivery of services, personal protective equipment. Uh, it's the resources that our states and our frontline providers will need in order to address this. The second piece of legislation that we passed was uh, Friday night late in the evening uh, by an almost unanimous vote, and that is help to individuals and to businesses. What we have to do requires not only execution by the state government, by our health care providers, but cooperation by our citizens. And we know that the best way to mitigate the harm from this virus is social distancing. And it has profound implications on our day-to-day -day lives, how we show up at work, how we work. Uh, can we go to a restaurant? And what we've seen in response from the governor uh, is the dramatic actions of closing down schools. We're going to hear a little bit more about some of uh, the requirements about gatherings. And it has a huge impact on our day-to-day -day life. And it's really tough 
for instance, if you're um, a service worker and you have a job at a restaurant and it's closed, and uh, how are you going to pay your bills? Uh, it's really tough on those employers who, because they want to do the right thing by their employees, have to furlough people or lay them off. Uh, and that's going to have a ripple effect, but it's going to have a very dramatic effect. We've seen that many of us in Vermonters, especially in the past, when we're not talking about the coronavirus, they get sick. As far as they're concerned, it's no big deal. They're showing up and they're going to push through it and they're going to take care of themselves and they're going to take care of their families. That doesn't work here. So the legislation that we've passed in the House and it's going to be considered by the Senate and it has, um, I'm very happy to say, the positive uh, support of President Trump himself, would do things that make it possible for individuals to help themselves and help the public health. So number one, it would provide up to 14 days of payment while a person is going through self-quarantine. Number two, it would provide up to three months of sick leave if you get the illness or a family member gets the illness. We've got to have those folks uh, isolated and they've got to have time to recover. Third, uh, it gets rid of regulations on unemployment insurance so that if an employer has to lay some folks off uh, because they're complying with the orders from uh, the governor, that they can start getting unemployment benefits immediately. The regulations that would otherwise apply don't. Fourth, uh, food stamps and nutrition. Our kids, many of them in Vermont, get absolutely essential nutrition at school. They're not at school. What we've done is waive the regulations that apply to the requirement that you be at school to get these meals. I spoke to the governor yesterday and he was always already talking about how will we perhaps deliver those meals and get them to the kids even though they're not at school. And I really appreciate that leadership by the governor. Um, it gets rid of the, for now, the work requirements that are otherwise required. I mean, there's no work, but you got to eat. It also, for our seniors, boosts funding so that we can deliver more meals to folks uh, who can't get out or can't necessarily go to the senior center uh, to get those meals. And then finally, uh, there's money in there for Medicaid reimbursement to the states. Vermont actually you know, already has a very pre a solid Medicaid program, but it would be helpful to Vermont. And the theory of this uh, policy, and again, I'm so delighted that it was bipartisan, is that individuals are impacted if they don't go to work, but the public is impacted if they do. So any individual who wants to take the best steps to protect himself and herself and her family is not only doing things that are good for them, it's good for the public. And the public health here requires all of us to do whatever it is we can and accept these extraordinary uh, uh, changes in our daily life. But the federal government's role is to acknowledge that this is bigger and larger than any of us. The person is, is not going to work is doing so because that's the public health requirement. And we want to hold him harmless. Vice President Pence said, we want to make sure you get your paycheck if you're out because of the coronavirus. Now, we've got work to do to make this work, but the intention of the legislation, uh, as stated by the Vice President and by all of us in Congress, is to basically hold harmless the individuals who are doing what's required. The actual execution and implementation is probably going to require potentially some legislative adjustments, uh, but it's going to fall on folks who are here uh, to actually execute and implement. And that's why I say what the state is doing and what individuals in these organizations that you can hear from are doing is really a challenge because it's going to be some trial and error. But we want to have a, a, a confidence among the state and the local health care providers and our community action agencies 
that the federal government is going to back you financially uh, uh, to get us through this. So uh, it's serious. We all know that. It's urgent. Uh, but we know how to proceed. We've got to do it together. Each of us has to do our part, and we'll get through it. But let's not underestimate that we've got a serious challenge. I'm going to turn this over now to Lindsay Curley, the Secretary of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. But I want to say I am so grateful to the leadership, stable and steady, that's been provided by Governor Scott. We need that. He's providing it. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, have been in regular contact with him and appreciate uh, the role he's playing as our top elected official here in the state of Vermont, Secretary Curley. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Welch. I want to echo your words right back at you. We really appreciate what you're doing on a national level to help our state. And we're only as good as those that are around us. And all of us will work together and, and we'll come out strong for this. So thank you. Thank you for including me today. Um, my name is Lindsay Curley. I am the Secretary of Commerce and Community Development. Every facet of Vermont's community is being impacted by COVID-19. As you're all aware, of the information, the guidance and knowledge about potential and avail available resources is fluctuating every day. Vermont's currently operating under a state of emergency and at the direction of Governor Scott, all state agencies have ramped up the responses to the community, individual and business needs. Additionally, before this press conference today, with updated guidance from the CDC, the governor has limited public gatherings to a maximum of 50 people or 50 percent of an establishment uh, establishment's occupancy whichever is less so for example if you are a small cafe and your um, occupancy is normally 40 you will be held to 20. so um, that is an update uh, that that just went out this morning the teams at the agency of commerce and community development and the department of labor are assessing and responding to the community and economic impacts of covid 19 on vermont's businesses very closely as of 5 30 last night our agency's disaster team had received status reports or requests for assistance from 82 unique businesses around our state these businesses run the gamut from inns dog breeders boarding businesses, bars, manufacturers, photographers, the list goes on. This small sample alone is a good example that this pandemic is impacting every facet of Vermont's business community. We're charting unknown territory in our state, but we're using our knowledge of previous disasters to guide and our approaches. We've turned our operations at the Agency of Commerce to helping businesses navigate these difficult times and we've assembled a data collection and emergency response team. Our emergency response team will be answering the questions we are receiving from businesses in a timely manner, and the data we're receiving from businesses will be provided to federal officials to ensure that Vermont receives any and all of the potential emergency and economic relief funds that we can. With that, I'm encouraging businesses and business owners to visit the Agency of Commerce's website to communicate to us how this pandemic has impacted your business. The more data that we're able to collect, the better we'll be able to respond to you in a meaningful way. And while you're on our website, please sign up for the agency's emergency response newsletter. As we know and learn more important information, we will share that with you as quickly as we can. So it's really important that if you wanna receive those communications that you're on that listserv. As we mentioned, the situation is changing so rapidly and decisions are made quickly but thoughtfully with guidance from state, local, and federal health officials. Although we do not need to remind you we're in the middle of responding to a disaster, recovery programs at the state and federal levels are going to take time to get up and running and we need people who are impacted to be on the website and on our mailing list. This will ensure that our team is able to quickly and efficiently communicate with you when we do have programs and or assistance in place. And while not, we may not have the answers right now or right away, it may take us a few days to respond. We are certainly receiving a lot of inquiries. Um, we're doing our absolute best to make sure we're capturing everyone and every business who reaches out. We're continuously evaluating other mitigation steps 
and will continue to keep the lines of communications wide open. I want to end by reminding everyone that every single one of us has a role to play in what we've been calling flattening the curve. And we're going to get through this together. We are united in our commitment to not only fight the virus, but to make sure that businesses and individuals who are being impacted or being taken care of are being heard and that needs are being addressed. We are united and to quote Governor Scott, we will come together as a community to defeat this in the short term so we emerge stronger in the long term. For COVID-19 related guidance for businesses, as I mentioned, we're encouraging you to visit our ACCD website. It is accd.vermont.gov. Again, that's accd.vermont.gov. Or you may go directly to the latest guidance from the Vermont Department of Health and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control at healthvermont.gov backslash COVID-19. Our emergency response line phone number for businesses is 802-461-5143. Again, that is 802-461-5143. And for businesses who want to report damages and seek assistance, be sure that you either call us or you visit that um, website as we suggested. At this point, I want to turn this over to Acting Labor Commissioner Michael Harrington. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Congressman. Um, before my remarks, let me just say that our top priority remains both individuals uh, who need assistance and benefits to make sure they get the resources they need, uh, and also to employers to make sure we're providing them uh, with as much support as possible. Um, this is uncharted territory for a lot of people and a lot of businesses, and the state is here to assist uh, in a number of different ways, and we'll continue to look for different ways to be supportive uh, during this time. So good afternoon, thank you for having me. As many of us know, the CDC guidance has identified the elderly and individuals with chronic medical conditions as more at risk than others. Slowing the spread of the virus, preventing cases has been identified as the best approach to ensure that the most vulnerable will have the access they need to the health care they deserve. The Department of Labor understands that in order to protect the most vulnerable, some businesses may temporarily close leaving employers without a paycheck, and in other cases, employees may need to take time off for self-quarantine, again, potentially without a paycheck. The Department of Labor understands that the impact of COVID-19 can have on work, working Vermonters and business owners, and the department understands and has fielded an array of questions from both employers and employees regarding eligibility for unemployment insurance benefits related to COVID. The department has issued guidance to staff that identify the steps the department is currently taking as it relates to the development of COVID-19. Staff have been advised that they shall not deny claims for able and available issues due to a claimant being isolated or quarantined at the direction of a healthcare official due to potential or verified exposure to COVID-19. These individuals shall be treated as temporarily unemployed through no fault of their own and able and available for the purpose of unemployment insurance benefits. For employees impacted by a temporary, temporary closure of a business and have been provided with a return to work date that is within the current 10 week period, the department has issued a, a work search requirement uh, waiver for both ones that are already existing as well as for individuals who are impacted by potential or verified exposure to COVID-19. The work search uh, requirement is also waived for those individuals. Additionally, the Unemployment Insurance Division has been directed to implement necessary, necessary measures to allow for a more expedited benefit payment process. This includes issuing payments to prior employer confirmation and shortening the electronic fund transfer validation process whenever possible. These measures were implemented on Saturday, uh, March 14th, and were effective immediately. The Vermont Department of Labor issued the guidance following guidance from the U.S. Department of Labor that encouraged states to exercise flexibility in authorizing benefits for individuals required to self-quarantine and consider them to be temporarily laid off, making them eligible for benefits. The Department of Labor is committed to supporting employers and employees during this time. 
We encourage anyone who has questions to contact the department. Additionally, on our website, labor.vermont.gov, we have additional guidance that will be posted on a regular basis for employers and employees uh, who are, have questions about unemployment insurance and other benefits. Uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna pass it off now to Sue Minter, or do we wanna have uh, Mamava come? Thank you, Sasha, uh, and thank you. Thank you, Secretary Harrington. Um, it was very nice to be asked to come here today because it's so nice to feel like you can be useful in times like this. I'm Sasha Mayer, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Mama Va. And we make uh, lactation suites for moms to use when they're out in public or at work. So our business is obviously very affected uh, by the circumstances that we're all experiencing. And we have about 40 employees, um, mostly in Vermont um, and a few across the country. And we have um, a manufacturer we work with in Springfield, Vermont, who has another 20 employees. So at Mamava, we sometimes talk about using a mother's mindset to get things done. And mom does what it takes to care for and protect her family. And we all know this can require creativity, care, and obviously sacrifice. Last week, our small business took proactive steps. We shifted to mandatory work from home, and we instituted what we are calling the TRU, or TRUE protocol. TRUE stands for thoughtful, resilient, and united. It is Mama Va's commitment to stay true to our employees, their families, our communities, and our customers. We are really lucky to have the technology and systems in place to be able to make this shift, this morning I was on a um, video conference, it was like Brady Bunch style with all of my colleagues um, and it was actually quite powerful to see their faces stay connected and troubleshoot how we can um, get through this together. We know that many employers employees are unable to make that work. <laughs> this includes many of our customers um, from retailers to airlines to hospitals and stadiums and of course to, for our manufacturer who it takes people to actually be there to get that work done. So it's very clear that no business will go untouched by the fallout from COVID-19. And we're really excited about HR 6201 as a proactive response. It's needed to keep our families, communities, and workplaces safe. Paid sick leave will prevent business owners and their employees from having to choose between their paycheck, the well-being, and the health of those around us. And we are so grateful for Congressman Welch's uh, work on this legislation. I'm confident, confident that if we continue to be thoughtful, resilient, and united, remember true, my husband is a middle school teacher, so I sent him <laughs> off today saying, tell those kids to, to stay true, and you can stay true to them as well. Uh, we'll all get this through get through this together and um, be a stronger uh, society and, and state and um, country for it. So I'd like to hand it over to Sue Minter, who is the executive director of Capstone. Thank you all and my appreciation to the governor and his team for his decisive leadership at this time and to the private sector and especially to Congressman Welch and to the Congress that has started to take the swift action that is absolutely necessary. So now you're gonna hear about the community um, and the most vulnerable in our community and how important this legislation and swift action is for all. Capstone Community Action has been building ladders out of poverty for low-income Vermonters since 1965. Our critical services range from our Head Start preschool to food shelf distribution, to emergency fuel assistance, ha homelessness prevention and housing services. And I want to underscore that the participants who use Capstone services are the backbone of our economy. Hard working people who serve Vermonters every day at your grocery store, your hospital, nursing homes, and schools. But as the coronavirus hits Vermont, we know that low-income people will be hit the hardest, as they are in every disaster. In fact, a report in the New York Times reported that COVID-19 is twice as deadly for low-income people. Hmm. We are all connected. 
COVID-19 makes it clear that if one person is sick or vulnerable, we are all vulnerable. And that is why it's so critical that the U.S. Congress, the House, and hopefully soon the Senate, is working swiftly to include the needs of low-income people, low-income Americans in this legislation. So here's what the bill can do for us. First, it's going to address the issue of food insecurity, something we know well. Our schools are closing imminently, as they must, to protect the community at large. But we know that, food, that schools are critical access areas for many of our children. So provisions, this bill adds provisions and additional aid, additional benefits for households with children who normally receive free and reduced meals. We know that one in four children are food insecure. While we envision that our food shelf and our community kitchen, which is right now preparing ready to eat meals for the folks who we serve at our food shelf, we know our food shelf and our kitchen will be increased, uh, the tra have more traffic in the upcoming weeks. So this bill is going to help provide families with the financial resources to purchase their own school, uh, their own food at stores using their three squares benefit. But it also increases the commodities available for us and schools if they stay producing meals to uh, access the food needed through a commodity assistance program for emergency food assistance known as TFAP. This will be crucial. In February alone, we had 500 people visit this food shelf, servicing over 900 family members, and three quarters of those received the TPAP food. That is just the greater Barrie area. So it's an indication of how widespread this need is, which many of you may be surprised by. We know that this number will increase as more people become unable to work or support their families due to the extended layoffs in the hospitality, retail, and lower income employment sectors. I also want to mention the importance of emergency leave. The first 14 days are unpaid if you don't have accrued vacation, leave, or personal time, but after that, we will have two-thirds of pay. I want to underscore how critically important it is for our clients to be able to rely on that. I want to suggest that there's probably more work to be done to expand these benefits, but the Congress is working very quickly on an idea nobody thought thinkable before, and it is essential, and this moment demonstrates it. Most of our clients that come here don't have paid vacation, paid sick time, or personal days. This is going to be devastating to low-wage working population who can't afford to miss any work. Two weeks of worth is half a month's income in to pay rent, to pay utilities, food, transportation, and childcare. The science shows that two weeks is not enough, so we know we can do more. But just imagine how hard it is for folks who only can afford to buy maybe two days of food and not the luxury of going to the store to buy two weeks of food. The combination of these critical uh, elements of this bill are critical and we are greatly appreciative. I do want to send a message to the wonderful hard working people we serve here at Capstone and our partner organizations across this state that we are all here for you. We see you, we love you, and we will not leave Vermonters behind. Even as we practice social distancing, which we must, we will not be emotionally distancing from those we serve. Capstone has already made important changes to our services. We have a key goal to maintain the critical services we deliver, but to reduce the risks for those we serve. That's why last week we spent all week planning what is in effect today. 
Our doors are closed, but our services are not. Our phone lines are still uh, serving people for emergency heat and housing. Our food shelf, while not open to come in the front door, is distributing pre-sorted bags out the back door. Our kitchen academy is working overtime to prepare meals that we know need to be distributed. All of our employees are practicing teleworking. Thank you to our IT who made this possible. Our Head Start, which serves 350 of the most um, at-risk families in our community, decided last week to close. We let our uh, parents know on Friday. But while our doors are shut, our services are continuing. We are doing home visiting uh, methods. We are in touch with all of the families we serve, creating phone communication, lesson planning, uh, delivering uh, materials and supplies, and we will continue to serve and deliver food to every family we currently serve. This is a model that I think can be replicated. We are uh, figuring it out today, and we're gonna improve it at day by day. Capstone is also thinking about the broader picture, and we are preparing with our partners to stand up in the next 48 hours a regional, a local um, response command center because we are concerned greatly about the impact of homeless people and families. We'll be able to report more to you on that. How are we going to make sure that the shelters do not increase in density? How are we going to treat homeless people who may have a fever, but we do not want to overload the hospital. A lot of important issues to come. We are thinking about it with our partners at the state, our community partners, and of course, we will be in touch constantly with Congressman Welch and our senators. I just want to end by saying we've been here before. Congressman Welch and Governor Scott and I have been on shared podiums during Tropical Storm Irene. and. I think we learned a lot of lessons that inform our work today. We're battle tested. We know that all recovery is local. That's why we're acting quickly at the local level. The quicker we move, the stronger we will be. That's why Governor Scott is taking dramatic action to close schools, because the more we can seclude ourselves from one another, the healthier we'll be. Innovation and creativity collaboration and partnerships. Those are the lessons I recall. But I also know that Vermont is an incredible state, and we learned that after Tropical Storm Irene, and I think we showed the world how we cope with crisis. So as we co confront the coronavirus, as we care for each other, and ensure that each of us comes through this challenge, I feel confident that we're gonna again show ourselves and the world what it means when we say we are Vermont strong. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, you. Wow. Um, thank everybody. Thank you. Any questions for any of us? Congressman Welch, you talked a couple of times today about how pleased you are about the bipartisan approach that's been taken. But if we look at the Senate in Washington today, we see something quite different. We see uh, some strong disagreements between the Republicans and the Democrats in the U.S. Senate about how to proceed with this bill. What would be your message to those folks? Get over it. We've got to help the folks who are going to be without a paycheck. And Vice President Pence had a quote that I thought captured it, and that is, you'll get your paycheck. People have to know that. We're asking them to do something that's good for us. They have no control over this. So we've got to hold them harmless. So that's the bottom line. Congressman, where is the money for all of this emergency federal spending going to come from? You know, if we have to borrow that money, we will. And this is about keeping the lights on and keeping the public healthy. Uh, and the role the federal government is that, that's uniquely, it's uniquely positioned to play is to help out in an emergency. And we can figure out how to pay for this, but right now, in order to address it, we can't stall on getting the paychecks out, uh, getting the unemployment regulations changed, uh, providing the tools to the governor and his teams that they need. And, you know, listening to all that's happening in unemployment, you're just moving ahead right away. It's going to be a real challenge. Secretary Curley, you were talking about 
Oh, sure. You bet. <laughs> the governor uh, banning meetings of more than 50 people and then half the capacity of those other uh, establishments? Yes. Some people think you ought to just, some states have closed bars and restaurants and stores, just close them down. What's the thought process of allowing you to stay open under these circumstances? So right now we're leaning on um, health officials and data to help guide our decision making. So I can promise you that everything is on the table. Uh, things are being considered. There just hasn't been a directive um, to force those shutdowns yet. I'm not saying there will be, but this situation is very fluid. As you saw with the, the schools, um, the change from Friday to Sunday pretty rapid because we learned more information. So, um, so to answer your question, we're, we're trying to stay up with that and stay on top of it and do what's safe for Vermonters and our country. You know, there's going to be a lot of trial and error as we proceed. And that's where there's got to be some heart in this because it's going to be tough at every level for families trying to figure out how to manage when their kids are not going to school anymore. I mean, that is so disruptive. And when I was talking to the governor, he was super sensitive to that. Our healthcare workers who were showing up, and God bless our healthcare workers, because they're showing up and putting themselves in jeopardy, uh, they've got kids. So this is a huge challenge for our secretary, our commissioner, for our executives, our business folks, but it really is coming down to individuals who ultimately uh, have an enormous challenge, uh, particularly when they've got kids that are no longer at school and their healthcare worker has to show up. So my view here is that we've got to be flexible. We've got to have some appreciation for the fact that the actual execution of these things is tough, but the people who are doing it are doing their best. Ideally, Congress will be responsive because we're going to get feedback from the governor's office. We're going to get feedback from our employers. And it may require that we make adjustments. We miss things. Well, if we respond quickly, if the governor's office and the administration respond quickly, if our families respond quickly, we're going to get through this sooner rather than later. But that takes some uh, solidarity. And I think we've got it in Vermont. I'm not sure if this is a question for uh, Labor or for, um, for you, Representative Welch, but are there, are there exemptions for who, um, for instance, if a business has X amount of um, employees that will be eligible for some of these benefits? There are. You're asking a, a very good question, and there's been some review of the legislation where it's pretty clear to me that we've got to make some adjustments. Uh, over 500 employees, about 86% of those companies already provide paid sick leave. There was a debate. Uh, d during the drafting of this bill between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, the way it is now, those the, the unemployment benefits would be coming from some of those employers, but dependent on their decision. My view, and I hope we can get to this in the Senate, is that everybody should be covered by the federal government who is out as a result of the, uh, the COVID-19. Uh, we can't really expect this burden to be put on our employers, particularly our smaller employers. Uh, and we certainly can't expect that this burden be borne by the individual. Keep in mind, that individual who is staying home from work, you might want to go to work, but they're doing that to benefit the public health as well as themselves. So there has to be a federal government standing behind them and supporting that decision. By the way, our economy is going to be better off the more we can keep money circulating. So there's enormous reason for us uh, to be trying to keep families afloat and small businesses afloat. Because even if we're successful at the federal level, getting some of these issues ironed out, our restaurants, our bars, our tourism industry, they're getting hammered. And they've got to get through it. We want them to get to the other side. What's your best guess? Uh, how long will this take? On the virus? Yeah. Well, you know, that's where I think it's dangerous for a politician to be giving health care advice. So, you know, at the federal level, I listen to the Center for Disease Control, and, you know, here Dr. Levine is, uh, I think, doing an excellent job. So I, I actually prefer uh, to not give opinions where I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, the funding uh, in these two bills would cover how long period? Well, look, the funding on the uh, uh, the legislation I, that we passed uh, Friday night in the House uh, would be open-ended. 
In other words, if you're out as a result of having to get self-quarantined, you're going to get your two weeks. If you're out uh, because you've got COVID-19 or a family member does and you're taking care of your family member, it's, it's three months. So the more people that have to self-quarantine, the more that, that get sick, the more it's going to cost. But the bottom line here is those folks who get it have to quarantine or take sick leave in order to help all of us. You mentioned a couple of the short-term steps that Congress has taken, the two that you just mentioned. Are there considerations or discussions now of once we get past this initial first couple of days, first week or so, what some of the long-term measures that are going to be considered by Congress? Very active discussions about what's our response to the economic impact of this. There's a lot of folks who think this may uh, this is the most severe challenge to our economy since the 2008 financial crisis. And it is. I mean, you just, you just think about it. Mamava, you know, they, they, their work depends on the airlines flying, people traveling. And that's not happening. I mean, it, it, I've seen all of the cancellations uh, from airline travel. Um, all of our business, the tourism industry here in Vermont, they're getting cancellations, cancellations, cancellations. Uh, and and uh, the travel restrictions uh, are having a significant impact on our, on our economy. Also, this is a situation where we're seeing the vulnerability with the globalization of the supply chain. Uh, and we haven't begun really to see the impacts of that. But manufactured products depend on getting many of the components that go into them from China or Asia. And there's often a six-week lead time for our local uh, uh, companies to get those parts to do their finish work. And as that supply chain is disrupted because Chinese factories are closed down, that's going to have an eventual effect right here. So we don't know the scope of that, but we know it's serious. And of course, the, right now, the virus is having a significant impact in Europe. And many of the health experts say, that Europe is now the new China. And all the actions Governor Scott has taken now, we're taking, are so that we don't become the new Europe. So the words for the average Joe out there are patience and don't panic? Um, Vermonters don't panic. <laughs> but this is a new kind of challenge for us. Because I, I, you know, I'll talk about myself, but I think I'm really talking for everybody. You may be nervous that you may get sick and it's a bad illness, but we're all nervous that somebody we know and love is going to get sick. You know, the numbers that are projected as to how many people will get ill, it's just hard for any of us to have real confidence no matter what we do that somebody we love is going to get sick. So that tells me, every one of us, to protect the people we love should do all that's being recommended, recommended about our social distancing and to understand that when the governor's making these uh, decisions, it's in our interest to follow that advice. You know, we're seeing where there's non-compliance, like in Italy and in, initially, and in France initially, uh, the illness spread. So it has an effect. Yes. So, uh, you know, the key to this is the testing, of course. Right. I'm sure we know what we've got, we can't respond to it. When is Vermont going to get the testing capabilities that it needs, and, and when will that be done? Well, I'll defer to, I don't know if anybody in the I, I would just, again, say, you know, the Vermont Department of Health, Dr. Levine is on top of that. That question should really be directed to him. Um, I don't want to presume what the right number of tests is, and. Um, but I, I would direct you to, the, to Dr. Levine in particular, but to answer right. those kind of questions. I mean, bottom line, our testing is behind, not our in Vermont, our in the nation. And uh, when you look at some of the other countries, they've been way ahead of us in testing. It's important for us to get that right yesterday, not today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's so important is the testing is not just to give you peace of mind, yes, you do or you don't have it. We're the extra test beyond persons with significant symptoms is about surveillance and identifying locations that are hotspots and where we need more resources. So that data 
uh, only it can be accumulated when we get more testing. Uh, but I would say that it's the federal government that has been behind the curve on this, not our states. They're doing everything that they can. And there's now an acknowledgement uh, in Washington that uh, we've got to really do everything possible to get all the tests out there uh, that are necessary to help us get through this. Uh, question for uh, administration. I mean, looking at, and this is a bit, bit of a speculative question, so I, I warn you. Um, but if, um, it seems like no one no one thinks that this is going to be a short moment in time where our economy may suffer. Can you kind of, how bad could it get, or if it continues on the way it is right now? Or what's basically best case scenario and a worst case scenario that we can kind of look at, if that's yeah. possible at the time? personally don't think that's possible. I mean, honestly, we are, as everybody keeps saying, we're in unchartered territory. I mean, um, you know, my mother said to me the other day, I'm 75 years old and I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen SARS and we've seen Ebola, but this is totally different. So I don't, I don't know, somebody smarter than me maybe could guess that, but I wouldn't venture a guess on that. Yeah, and you know, the point here is we don't know how long it'll go on, but we do know the steps we can take to make that shorter rather than longer. And that's what we're all trying to do. What can we do today to have it be short, not long? And every single person in Vermont has a role to play in that. The only thing I would add to that is, as a state, we're doing the, the planning and preparation we need to um, so that we can respond either to a, a short event or a longer event. And, Every department and division is going through that process of planning so that we have the appropriate response and resources we need, no matter how long or short the situation is. And then again, speculative again, um, but how many workers could potentially be impacted by this? I know earlier you said it could be every, everyone, or but is there any number right now, or is that too early? Uh, I think it's way too early, and that would be total speculation at this point. Um, the one thing I will add, though, um, and I probably should have said it earlier, is that you know, if there are employers out there who are looking to temporarily shut down operations um, you know, to help control the spread of this virus, uh, I would just ask that they reach out to the Department of Labor so that they can plan that with us. Uh, it's much easier for us to provide them with the support and the guidance and the information they need up front to make sure it's a smooth transition both for them and their employees as opposed to after the fact. Uh, and so they can find that contact information on our website, but it's certainly much easier for them and for us to work with them early as opposed to later. I would also say that, you know, both at the federal level but also at the state level, our unemployment insurance law is very complex. Uh, and, um, and there are a lot of nuances. And what I would hate is for an employer to make a decision that they feel is in the best interest of their employee, but have that have a negative effect on whether that person is eligible for long-term benefits or not. And so again, that's why it becomes important for them to talk to us first uh, so we can help coordinate with them. So I'm actually a little confused. For businesses now, they're deciding to close and lay off employees because they think it's the right thing to do, right? Yeah. Uh, what's the process for those employees going through unemployment insurance? Sure. Going to be a lot, are you cutting most of the hoops for them? Can they look forward to getting an un unemployment check in the next couple of weeks? So the, the congressman can certainly speak at the federal level for us. Um, they still go through the normal process of applying and opening an initial claim and then providing weekly uh, claims thereafter, depending on how long the layoff is. Uh, I will also say though, clearly as we've seen just over the past week, um, the number of impacted individuals is increasing and that puts an additional strain on our uh, claim center and our call center. Um, so I would just encourage people to be patient. We'll expedite as quickly as possible, but there is uh, a volume issue as well. Uh, and you know our ability to process claims um, is really dependent on the, the influx of calls. And it is likely that um, there will be a delay just in people being able to get through uh, to our claim center. And that's where we would, again, just ask for patience. Um, we will make sure that your claim gets processed. We will make sure you get the benefits uh, you deserve. Um, and it just may take a little time uh, because there may be a, an influx of people calling. How, how, many, how many of those claims have there been? Uh, I'd have to check. It's actually changing on an hour-by-hour hour basis. Uh, I can tell you that at any given time across the state, we run somewhere around 
3,200 to 3,500 unemployment claims at any given time prior to the COVID-19 situation. Uh, and so we certainly expect that to spike. Uh, and that just, again, puts an additional strain on our resources. Well, uh, thank you all very much. And uh, stay safe. And, and uh, you know, I like your comment. Social distancing does not mean emotional distancing. Mm -hmm. And we need each other. Yeah. So thank you for reminding it's us really of that. It's really hard so. not to give hugs, but we can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.